Good morning, everyone. Thomas Montgomery with IIMFL and Smart Money Alliance. We're a 501c3 nonprofit and, and here to talk to our distribution partners today. We get together most weekdays at this time, about a minute before eight o'clock centrals when we normally get started on this webinar Zoomcast. Uh, we typically record as we are doing today to share with those of you that can't attend live because I know the schedule may not match up perfectly with yours. Yesterday, we went through, I guess, a little bit of a premature presentation on how lucrative it is for us to collaborate in setting up a joint venture small business incubator. However, uh, while we had tremendous response yesterday, a few faults or omissions were identified. So we've cleaned that up and we're gonna go through that now over the next few minutes. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers afterwards. So let's step back. Why is this relevant? There are many, many small businesses, those that are pre-launch startup and even existing that want to need capital. That's a fact. Secondly, many of them don't have access to the capital they need because they lack the credibility. And I don't mean them as an individual, I'm not judging them, but their business setup is not credible enough to access the types or the amounts of capital that they need. So we developed a small business incubator format that we launched and it's been working tremendously successful. So now we're ready to expand that and partner with any of you that might be interested and together we'll set up a joint venture, JV for short, small business incubator. The purpose of today's discussion is to be very factual, very quantifiable to understand how you would benefit from it, going through a lot of detail. And we've added more detail than we had even yesterday. So let's go through it. If you were on the call yesterday or heard it, still stick with me here because there's some significant omissions yesterday, not intentionally, that we've covered today. Okay, so what we're going to do is look at essentially an income statement of what we can anticipate if we set up a joint venture small business incubator. Before we get to the, the meat of the numbers, I want to work kind of around the income statement and make sure we're all clear on the assumptions, the definitions, and so forth. So first of all, on assumptions, we know that when a client enrolls in your incubator, now when I say yours, we're gonna set up a relationship together where you run the incubator, you are the incubator manager, the clients are paying you, you're controlling the dollars. And then, but it's, it's a 50-50 split and we'll, we'll go through that here in a bit. But it is your incubator, we're just providing the turnkey resources, support, infrastructure to make it happen and get it cash flowing quickly. So each client that enrolls in your joint venture small business incubator is going to pay your entity $999. Now, that's a great deal because of all that they're getting. And frankly, the way that we set it up, it's, it's technically a refundable deposit. So they're getting it back. The second assumption is because we know that when we set up a loan package, which is part of what we're doing in the first four weeks when a client's in your incubator, we're putting together their business plan and financial projections, uh, their key person policy, which serves as a collateral assignment. We're going to talk more in detail about that today. There are lots of questions about that yesterday. So we know on average, it's going to generate $1,000 for that. We know that the average performance fee for each client going through your incubator is 6,000. Now that's calculated based on, we know that we guarantee them a $100,000 capital raise. We know that the performance fee is 6%. So this is quite conservative because this is the floor. If they stopped at 100,000, then this number is correct. Many small businesses want to need more than just 100,000. So this number would continue to go up and it would continue to be split. But for conservative sake, we're gonna put the minimum performance fee that the incubator would collect. 
What we forgot to include yesterday is the credit boost income distribution. So let's talk about that. Credit boost, which is also available on a standalone basis, is where clients need to add to their personal credit score to qualify for certain types of capital. Now, we're already helping them build their business credit automatically through the curriculum. But outside of the basic curriculum, if they need help boosting their personal credit scores, then that's part of the, the service offering that's available a la carte through the joint venture small business incubator. And while there's no charge to the client up front, uh, they do pay based upon the results. Our assumption here, and this is right on, about 75% of the incubator clients are going to need a credit boost based upon their credit profile. And then the last assumption is that we're going to be able to help the average client that's going through the credit boost increase their scores by around 100 points in 30 to 60 days. So there's our first set of assumptions. The joint venture incubator split is essentially 50-50. However, and we'll go through the numbers here, in some cases we're absorbing the cost. So for example, we're paying for the phone service and their business phone line and the, the, the submission to national 411 directory assistance. We're buying their QuickBooks and such. And so we, we can't just 50-50 split the income when we're eating all the expenses. So it is a 50-50 split of, of the net, but we have to back out, of course, the expenses. So for example, 999 is the deposit, refundable deposit that each client pays when they enroll in your incubator. We're spending right about 70% of that. And so that's why you see that we need to allocate that. Otherwise we're going in the hole for every client that enrolls. We'll split the key person policies 50-50. I'm gonna talk more about that here in a minute because there was a lot of questions about how that's working now. We'll split the performance fees 50-50. We're splitting the credit boost income 50-50. The, um, there's incubator client fees of the $99. That is split, but again, you have to understand that IIMFL is incurring direct cost for keeping that client live on QuickBooks, keeping their phone system live and so forth. So it is a 50-50 split but recognize we need to back out our hard costs before we split the, the net. We encourage you to set up a salary. We encourage it to be 10,000 a month. We're gonna talk more about what we think your comp plan should be. Just to clarify, that's coming out of your side of, of the 50-50 split. And then lastly, which we'll, we'll talk more about here in a, a minute when we get over to the numbers, there, there are no, other overhead cost if we set up a joint venture incubator where we're domiciled. But if you want to set one up, like we talked yesterday about Will, who's on again today, he's setting one up in New Jersey. Well, guess what? There's going to be a cost for him to go lease space in New Jersey for his virtual incubator that we're going to do together. But then we take Ed, Ed's in uh, another part of Texas, not near us. He's actually going to domicile his where we are. And so this is accurate for him because we're already paying the lease. We're not going to charge back Ed or the joint venture incubator for our lease or for the liability insurance we have to buy or for the internet. So it, the overhead cost can very well be zero or it could be a lot. That would be up to you. And so in this assumption, we're, we're assuming that there are no additional overhead costs. But frankly, again, that's within your control. All right, what we didn't cover very well yesterday that we wanna cover here today is that there are responsibilities, right? We're putting together a JV, a joint venture small business incubator. So what is it that you're doing? Now, if you wanna delegate this, you can, that, that's up to you. But, but on your side, you're managing the people relationships, the relationships with the prospects and the clients. And that includes doing the 15 minute mentoring. We've stopped having financial literacy educators do mentoring with clients because there was some inconsistency. 
we know through a joint venture small business incubator, we'll be working very closely together so there won't be inconsistencies. So that is a responsibility of the joint venture small business incubator manager is managing the people relationships. And, and many of you love that and are excited about that. Again, the incubator is gonna be your entity and clients are gonna be paying you. You're gonna control the money, therefore you need to manage the finances of the incubator. If you wanna outsource that to a bookkeeper or CPA, you can. But just to clarify, I mean, this is your business. We're collaborating on it, but when we do a joint venture incubator, this is your business. This is not you coming to work for us or for someone else. This is an extraordinary entrepreneurial opportunity that you own and you're managing. What we decided to do is get all of our incubator managers together on a quarterly basis. Our preference is to do it face to face in, in places that we'd all like to be at the right time of the year. So, you know, Vegas in winter would be nice. We probably wouldn't want to go to Phoenix in the summertime. But the bottom line is we would like to get all of our incubator managers together once a quarter. If we have to do it virtually based upon the pandemic, we can. But uh, just keep in mind, we would like to get together quarterly so we can all network and learn together face to face in addition to our remote support. OK, next section. Lots of questions yesterday regarding the key person policies. So. The way that we're setting up the key person policies through the incubators is a very lucrative and simple approach. What we were doing previously was painful. It was taking forever and a day to get these IULs approved, especially through Nationwide. So we're not going to do it that way. It didn't work well. It was painful for us all. So through the incubator, the key person policies will be set up as a return of premium, commonly referred to as an ROP policy. People love it, right? You either die, which we hope you don't, the client, we hope the client doesn't die, and the policy pays out, or if they don't die, they get their premiums back. Think about that for a second. That is such an easy conversation to have. Leading with an IUL in this environment is difficult because a lot of these folks aren't really to the position that they're ready to start saving money. They're trying to, to accumulate capital to, to propel their business. So I really feel that the more suitable project, more suitable policy design for most of these clients is actually an ROP. And that's what we'll be doing through the incubator because people love it can't lose. You either die and it pays out, which again, the hope doesn't happen, or you get your money back. We have it set up so we have a whole back office that's going to take care of all the painful paperwork. Any of us that were involved with writing those IULs through Nationwide, it was months of never-ending data tracking, document collection. It was a beating. No more of that. Literally five minutes of the agent's time. The rest our back office will take care of. Simplified underwriting, which again, accelerates the process, more um, easier to get the clients engaged because there's typically not going to be any paramed visits, no fluids and so forth. The comp level is strong. It's a little bit above 90%. And of course, there's residuals. So that's a good solid um, income off of each policy. And again, we're projecting that we'll generate around $1,000 per and because of all these other things, it pays out quickly. We're not waiting months and months and months to get paid. We're paid upfront, full commission, quickly. All right, one other area, and then we're getting over to the, the numbers. Uh, there were several questions that came in after yesterday's training saying, okay, how would I be paid again if I, if I do this, if I become a joint venture partner? Okay, number one, we'd like you to have a salary. We strongly believe in your salary being W-2. That way your profit sharing, which is a lot, which we'll get to, is not subject to employment taxes. That's also allowing you to continue to contribute to Social Security. It's going to give you W-2 paycheck stubs. So if you want to go buy a house, buy a car, those things where they look for validation of income. So you don't have to take a $10,000 a month salary, but that is the recommendation, the preference. 
We do believe that you should have a company car that would be under the EIN. Again, that's optional, but that's recommended. I do that. I think you'd want to do that too. Obviously, we need to be planning for the future. We didn't talk about this yesterday and questions came up. Of course, we want to set up a retirement plan and a full benefit package to make sure that the incubator manager and his or her family is taken care of. And then there's the other question about profit sharing. When do we do profit sharing? In our agreement, we do profit sharing weekly. Now we're going to get to what the profit should be looking like in just a moment. Okay, we can see there's a, a green coded here. And again, we've not talked about the numbers yet, but the reason why month four is coded green is because obviously by the fourth month, now we have three months of bank deposits. And for any entity, whether it be a donut shop or a small business incubator, what we know is once we have three months of significant bank deposits, the world opens up for uh, additional sources of capital. So again, this incubator is yours. So after three months of good income in month four, which is green, if you wanted to go get a, a line of credit for a quarter of a million dollars, 250,000 that you could use for whatever you wanted in life, that's very reasonable because we've demonstrated significant cash flow for three consecutive months. And then of course we have more information on our incubator page. All right, so now let's drill into the numbers. We've kind of covered the, the background of what's going into it. We're going to have a goal of having 100 incubator participants per incubator. Now, there's going to be some ramp up. We're not going to open up in December together and have 100 clients, incubator clients, in your joint venture incubator in month one. So our goal is to add an average of about one a day. That, that's not a concern. If you look at how many small business owners that are out there and then through uh, joint education and, and creating awareness, teaching things like the 27 mistakes to keep small businesses from getting financed, helping pre-launch businesses launch, no shortage, no shortage of opportunity. But we are assuming that we're going to add on average just over one new client a day. Now, dropping down, we also assume that once we get them funded, that they'll graduate out of the incubator. So we're not planning something that's unrealistic. So we have this perpetual growth and all of a sudden we have thousands and thousands of incubator clients to manage. That's too much. Instead, we help them get funded and they go off on their own. And then we replace that slot with the next incubator client. There's nothing that prevents you from taking on or us from taking on more than a hundred incubator clients at a time. But that's, that's the number that this pro forma is built off of. Because again, remember, just for clarity, you're managing those relationships. Now, if you wanted to hire staff that helps you, then obviously you'd have greater capacity. But all of this is off the assumption that you're not hiring any staff. Now, if you want to, of course, you can grow and, and maybe your opinion's bigger is better. But this is not assuming that you're incurring any labor cost other than your labor, pa your comp package, which we've talked about. All right. So with that being said, let's get into it. So month one. Well, when is month one? It depends upon when you want to get started. So we're recording this as of November 20th. So we'll say that month one is December of 2020 for those of you listening to this live. So first line item of income are the deposits. And again, that's $9.99 per participant times 33 new clients. And you can see the formula there. So we brought in 32000 projected in December, first month, uh, in your incubator. That's a good start. Now we're going to just over double that by getting the key person policy set up. Gina was asking, well, do you have to be a licensed agent to be a JV incubator manager? Absolutely not. No, we can do this. And we're still going to split it 50-50 with you. That's the deal we've made. So if you're not, but it has to be indirectly, of course, because if you're unlicensed, technically you can't be paid insurance commissions. But regardless of, of that detail, which we'll handle offline, um, we're going to generate around 66000 in the first month, just off of these two, 
based upon the deposits and the key person income. We don't anticipate any performance fees coming in in the first month because we need to get the clients in, take them through the four week process, build their loan package. And so that won't happen in month one. While we do anticipate that 75% of the clients that are enrolling in the incubator will benefit from credit boost, we talked about that down here, that won't show immediate results. So we're not gonna see that income in month one. So month one's a little skinnier granted than, than where we'll end up. What we forgot to mention yesterday that we've added in today, of course, is we're sharing with you the incubator participation fees because to be in the incubator, there's the upfront refundable deposit that they pay, but they also pay the $99 fees and it's referenced over here, number five, and we share that 50-50, again, after we back out our hard cost. So the, the expected total gross income for the first month of the incubator is 79,000. Now, if you look at that and say, eh, I don't think it'll be that much that soon, then of course, this is an editable spreadsheet. So we can go in and, and change the numbers based upon what you think is more realistic. Maybe it's half of that. Maybe it's three quarters of that. It, it doesn't matter. It's a spreadsheet and we can do what if scenarios all day long. So now let's get down to the expenses. We know that our cost, well, I guess your cost to joint venture with us to set up what we call a branch office or now we're kind of referring to as an inc a joint venture incubator, it's a thousand a month. We will finance that at 0%, it's technically paid out $250 a week, so it's very affordable, but that is an expense for us to, to collectively do this. I was talking to a prospective incubator joint venture partner yesterday. He's like, well, why should I do that? Well, I guess go do it on your own, right? If you've got all the tools and resources and you can go flip the switch and you can go make 79,000 next month on your own, why are you on our webinar right now? but it, sometimes it makes sense to collaborate and we can bring the infrastructure and the know-how, you bring uh, your skill set, and together we can generate a lot of income and help a lot of people. And that's what we're gonna talk about in just a second. So there is, that. that's an expense of operating the business. I guess it's analogous if you wanted to sell pizzas, right? You could just open your own pizza shop and roll the dice or you could go buy a Domino's franchise. Is Domino, and we're not a franchise, but, but it's a good enough analogy to use. So, I mean, does Domino's work for free? No, of course not. So if you're going to work with Domino's, there's going to be some cost to have that collaboration and they're going to ship you the, um, the pepperoni, right? So there's going to have to be some offset of, of cost for them to give you the, the supplies for the pizzas. And that's, that's a close analogy here. Okay, so we have the, the monthly incubator license fee, but it's not variable. It's just a, a very affordable $250 a week. Now, once the license fee is paid in full, as many of you know, we give back $25,000 to you, the branch manager slash incubator manager, and that can be used for whatever you want. If you qualify for upfront financing, third-party financing rather than us doing it, then you can get the $25,000 upfront. Otherwise, we're financing it at 0% interest, 250 a week, and that's what this line represents. So what is your startup cost to start a joint venture incubator? $250. And again, you know, if you can find a way to help more people and generate more income for a $250 investment, probably what you should be doing. Startup client costs. So again, we said, you know, we're paying the filing fees to form the, the, the LLC, the C Corp, the S Corp. We're buying the QuickBooks license. We're buying the, um, we're getting the phone system set up for them. So this is a reflection that about 70%, which was covered up here, of the startup cost is, is true hard cost. So we need to back that out, right, of, of profit. And, and so then this is consistent only because we're assuming that we're adding consistently 33 new clients a month. If we change these numbers, then of course this number would go up or down because it's proportionate to the number of incubator clients that are starting. Now, your salary, you control this. We recommend 10,000 a month from month one. 
If you want more, you want less, it's technically being backed out of your 50% of the profit distribution. So you have flexibility there. If you wanted to make it 20,000 a month, you could. 10,000 a month is a sweet spot because again, it gives you a six digit stable income and then it allows all the profits that are distributed above to be distributed without employment taxes and that'll save you a ton of money. Incubator overhead cost, as we made a little bit of a reference to earlier, this can be zero. If you wanna base your incubator out of our commercial address, then we won't have any additional expenses. But again, as I mentioned earlier, Will doesn't wanna do that, which I respect. Will's gonna go lease a building in New Jersey. Well, there's gonna be extra cost for that, of course, because that landlord's going to want to be paid. We already pay our landlord, so we don't need to charge that back to our JV relationship. And then monthly client cost. So again, these are expenses, not to you, but to the, to the joint venture, because we know that of the money that we're collecting from the client, about 75% of that are hard costs that we need to cover, such as paying again for their monthly QuickBooks subscription and so forth. So that is reduced off of the income. So when we take all the income, which is here for month one, and all the expenses for month one, which is cumulatively here, here's what we project the net income to be. 35,000. If you think that's too much, then we can go in and change these assumptions. You wouldn't just type in a different number here, but we can change the assumptions wherever you would like and come up with a new number. But we would be splitting that 50-50. So again, you'd be making 10,000 a month salary and then 50% of 35,000 would be your profit share, which would be another, what, 17,000 or so, which isn't get rich, but it's a good month. You know, there's not many businesses you can launch and reasonably anticipate twenty to thirty thousand dollars of personal income, but month one is is pretty skinny compared to the rest. Let's let's move on. So month two, our direct deposit income is the same because we're still enrolling thirty three new clients. The key person policy is still the same because we need to write those key person policies on again thirty three new people. However, now we start to see clients come out of the four week curriculum and now they're able to go to funding. Now, in truth, will all clients go to funding directly at 30 days? Some will, some won't, some will be ready, some will need some more work. So this number is accurate, the, the timing might be off and we'll have to see based upon the, the blend of clients that are enrolling in your incubator. So that 198,000 is, is a real number, maybe it really doesn't happen in month two, maybe it, it takes until month three. But regardless, let's assume after they've been with us for a month and the, as long as the credit markets continue to remain open, now the performance fees pour in, which we know we're splitting 50-50, but we split 50-50 the net. So these, this is showing where the money's coming from. We assume no credit boost income yet in month two, even though we have a number of people, 75% of the clients from month one in credit boost, we need more time for that to report on their bureaus, 30 to 60 days. So that hasn't happened yet. And then the participation fees. Now this number doubled, right? From prior, because we had 33 people that enrolled in month one, then we had 33 more enroll in month two. So that's why we have income really boosted in month two because now we're starting to see this very valuable revenue stream come in the performance fees so now we're projecting almost three hundred thousand dollars of gross income and again if you think that's too much too soon we can go in and change the assumptions but it's going to be a lot more than month one of course so you're saying oh do i get 50 percent of two hundred ninety thousand? of course not Every business has expenses. Domino's has to buy the crust or the flour to make the crust. Our incubator has expenses to be able to operate. So let's get to those expenses. The license fee is stable. We've talked about that. It doesn't change each month. The startup cost is 70% of the deposit. And that is only stable because again, we're assuming we're starting the same number of new clients each month. If, if we grow this quicker, then of course there'll be more money coming in, but more expenses. 
Your salary is set at, again at 10,000 stable. You can always change that if you want. No overhead costs are illustrated, assuming that we're using our commercial address. Again, if you're using the will model and setting up your own, then of course, there's probably gonna be expenses, aren't there? And then the monthly client cost is a function of us covering our cost out of the income derived from the client. So all of a sudden our projected net income is pushing a quarter of a million in month two. Again, if you feel like that's too much too soon, we can go in and change the assumptions, but you see the formula and how it's calculated. Even if it's half of that and we're at 120,000, that's what we're splitting 50-50 with you. So you'd have your 10,000 base pay. And then in that example, you'd have what, about 118,000 <laughs> profit distribution. And then you can follow the sequence on. So let's let's get to your questions. And I don't mind any constructive criticism, anything that you see wrong with this model. This is built legitimately and accurately based upon what our experience has been so far now that we've launched one incubator. Now we're ready to replicate that at, at a very significant pace. So with that, let's get into your questions regarding the incubator model. So again, Gina asked earlier, do you have to be a licensed insurance agent to do a JV incubator? No, absolutely not. It is at the same time, is this probably the most lucrative way for a licensed insurance agent to write consistently 33 policies a month, plus draw a salary, plus do a profit share? Absolutely. So if you know of a licensed insurance agent, I'd be introducing this and we can make it well worth your while. We're gonna set up a very lucrative commission or a referral fee. You bring us incubator managers and we'll pay you five grand, $5,000 for feeding people in because we wanna help more small businesses. So even if you don't wanna be an incubator manager, drive people into us. If they become an incubator manager, then we'll pay you five grand. Okay, so let's get to your questions. Uh, the other question is, wh what does the client pay to enroll in the incubator? And that's right here, Gina. They're going to pay a $999 refundable deposit when they enroll in the incubator, as shown. Thank you for that question, Gina. Okay, and Kelvin asked a really good question. And I didn't go into it probably as deep today as I did yesterday. So Kelvin's saying, okay, okay, this, this looks really good. However, where are we going to get these 33 people? Again, remind me of that, he's saying. So that's fine, Kelvin. Well, we have access to a database of every newly formed entity. So every DBA slash assumed name filed, and those are at the county courthouses, every LLC, every C Corp, every S Corp, every home-based business. So that is, is a good start. Of course, we can market out to key influencers in our community. We can do educational presentations like the 27 mistakes that keep small businesses from accessing capital is a great about 45 minute educational presentation that you can give live or online. Why? Because it talks about if you want to access capital, you need to be credible. And to be credible, you need things like a commercial office address and a business phone number that's listed to directory assistance. You need to have a website. You need to use QuickBooks so you can generate income statements and balance sheets. You can't be looking professional with a Gmail or a Yahoo or American Online. And that's what this incubator is providing along with a guaranteed $100,000 capital raise, Kelvin. So uh, we just need to identify our target audience, which are pre-launch and early stage small businesses, and then get the word out. And so uh, if you wanted, you could pay referral fees for people to refer prospective clients to you, but uh, there's no shortage of small business owners that want capital and if they want capital, they need to be credible. And this is a great way for them to become essentially instantly credible or near instantly. Thank you, Kelvin, for asking that. Great question. Ah, John asked a really good, uh, Mr. Steele asked a really good question. So 
in, in our base model, the incubator, we're bringing someone in that that's clean and fresh and starting a new business. And we can set up what we've talked about shell companies or just, just a new entity. But I think what John's getting at is what if they have an existing entity, could they still plug in? Absolutely. And so if they don't want to start a new entity, they've already started one, then, then that's fine. We can plug it in. We'll be flex more flexible in that regard than we've talked about before. So this is going to be extraordinarily attractive to those that have not started their new business yet because we're providing everything from the filings all the way through. But for those that have already started, but they want our help, your help, uh, through the, the joint venture small business incubator, that's fine. So they could come to us and already have an existing entity, but maybe John, they're looking for a capital raise. They have some credibility voids that they need assistance with. That would be fine. Uh, John also asked as far as setting up his joint venture small business incubator, what, what does he need to do? And I'm paraphrasing a bit, but essentially you would just go to our incubator page and down at the bottom there is an inquiry form and let us know that you're interested in collaborating and then we can get that set up but, but john you're right your incubator is going to have to have some sort of entity behind it so uh, it could be a dba an assumed name a c corp s corp llc it doesn't matter but but yeah you'll you'll need an entity that's operating the incubator and then we execute what we call a business license agreement to collaborate but um, yes you would need some sort of entity formal or informal and yes you'd need a bank account because you got to remember this is how much money according to these projections going into your business bank account every month right uh so, you know soon hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. So that money needs to go somewhere and that would go into your business bank account. Thank you, John, for asking that. Yep, yeah, and we can certainly go through and what we'll do is we'll work individually. So any of you that want to, to, to do some different what if scenarios, we can set up a, a standalone call or a Zoom and start changing these variables to, to look what you, uh, like what you would like. What I'll tell you though, is we are not looking to develop joint venture partners to have minimal results. Our goal is for each joint venture incubator to enroll hundred clients a month. And we're gonna help you and work hard and that's absolutely attainable. We should have a wait list for your joint venture incubator. So what we're not interested in doing is saying, well, what if we add, and this is not what Quan was asking, but what if we added one or two or three, well, we're not in business to operate an incubator with one or two or three new clients a month. There's way too much opportunity. We've been adding an average of 10 a week and we've been putting partial time into it because we've been getting this structure set up so we can replicate with you. So uh, th there's no question if we're adding 10 or so a week, I might have said a month, but 10 or so a week, uh, there's no doubt that if you're focused on this that we can add one a day on average. Thank you, Kwong. Brian asked, if we start an incubator at our IIMFL address and businesses need a physical address. Okay, so what's crucial is when we set up incubators, every incubator client has a unique address, a unique suite number. We do not do shared addresses. The world's full of shared addresses. You can go to Regis and pay somewhere between 100 and 200 a month and get a shared address. But what happens is you're getting a shared address with lots of other small businesses. That does not meet credibility standards. So let's pretend, and this is a bit of a exaggeration, but Brian, let's pretend that you and I just bought a skyscraper and there's thousands of office suites, but we bought it and, and it's vacant. And so now we can lease out offices. Well, that's kind of what we're doing is we're leasing out physical office suites that are to be used virtually as part of this package. So every client receives, incubator client receives a unique address. It will never be a shared address. Now, if we were in Trump Tower in, uh, in Manhattan, is there one street address 
with thousands of different office suites across all the floors? Of course. So the street address doesn't keep changing. That's not the problem. We just need to make sure we have unique suites. We can add thousands of suites to our office building here. We lease an entire floor. So you're right. Same street address is permissible. What a client doesn't want to get is a shared suite number. And we're not going to do that. But you're right. There's going to be a lot of mail coming in. Okay, so Gina asked, um, yeah, I, I think it's important to separate this discussion. This is kind of the golden ticket, Gina. If you're looking for a significant opportunity to make an adult income through a turnkey solution, then being a, a joint venture incubator manager and entering into this relationship is probably a really good fit. Now, some of you just simply want to be an affiliate and just refer people and you can just be a referral source and do nothing else and, and that's perfectly fine and you can earn a great income for that. Here we're talking about how can we strategically build something significant on a large scale with, again, your out-of-pocket startup cost is $250, one quarter of that. Okay, let's see other questions here. Okay, and, and the question is, what about prior experience? We're going to work very closely with our joint venture incubator managers. What had happened is we started building all these financial literacy educators and had well over 100 of them. A lot of them did nothing. Some of them did a lot, and, and it, it pulled us too thin. So uh, we will provide the training and the support, the uh, immediate access to, to support, to make our joint venture incubator managers successful. We're in this together, right? We're doing a 50-50 split. We're, we're business partners, essentially. So uh, there is no specific prior experience necessary. We just need to get the incubator set up and then we can train and support you. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Thank you for that question. Uh, Annette's asking, right. So in the incubator model, the key person policies I stated right here and this, what we're talking about the incubator manager and the incubator manager, we're not going to write IULs because what we're seeing is that typically these early stage businesses, they're not really suitable for an IUL, but they really like the return of premium. It's going to be less expensive for them. You might say, well, that cuts my commission. Yeah, but the comp level is so high and the work level is so low. I mean, so if you're making in, in less than five minutes, and that's not an exaggeration because we have people that's going to work with the client and filling out the app and doing all the work. So if you're spending really about five minutes and it's generating a thousand dollar commission, I, I don't know you can beat it. But I think a lot of insurance agents, not speaking to you and in individually, are, are, are missing the point. I think what we need to do is offer a broader value proposition and then the insurance sales becomes automatic. You'll, you'll never have to worry about writing 30 policies a month again, because that's the type of flow through we have of participation in the joint venture incubator. Okay. Robert asked a really good question. So we, when they go through as an incubator client, we're providing the credibility factors like the commercial address, the business phone number, the website, the QuickBooks and so forth. We're helping them get set up with CPA, helping them get set up with a business banker, all those things, correct, correct, correct. And then we're also taking them through the four week curriculum, building their loan package, improving their financial literacy. That's correct, Robert. Yes, we're guaranteeing them, them at least a $100,000 capital raise. So that's great incentive for them. That's why we know we can count on this performance fee because we have a contractual agreement with the client that says we will help you raise at least 100,000 and you agree to work with us to raise at least 100,000 and of the money raised, you agree to pay the incubator, the joint venture incubator, 6%. So again, 6% of 100,000 is at least 6,000 per client. Robert also asked, well, what's the time frame? Well, it depends on the client, right? We've got to get them credible. We want to get them credible as quickly as possible, but they have to be credible to get funding, right? 
And so there could be equity-based financing, debt-based financing, but the specific timeline for each client, Robert, and I, I bet you know this, you're just quizzing me, is dependent upon the client, right? We don't have a magic wand of saying, hey, sign up for our joint venture incubator. And all of a sudden some lender is gonna throw caution to the wind and give you $100,000 in 30 days just because you're an incubator client. That's too good to be true. Now, what we do have is certain sources of capital like the Chapman Fund that is available to incubator clients. It's not available to the, the nation at large. It's tax subsidized loans, which means it's really easy, not a given, but very easy to qualify for up to 250,000. So that's part of the secret sauce. But Robert, don't fall into the trap that of giving people impression, yeah, sign up for the incubator, you'll get a hundred thousand or a million dollars on day 31. If they qualify for that, they're credible enough, then that's great. We're working on many of their credibility factors, but uh, we, we will continue to work with them until they qualify for whatever capital raise they want. We guarantee at least a hundred thousand. Very good. All right, so Doug asks, is it okay to begin this business using our location without having overhead, which is attractive, right? Because we've, we're already paying that overhead. And then setting up one locally in the future. Yeah, so Doug, it's perfectly fine for us to have multiple incubators together. You could start one and we could operate here out of our physical address, which isn't uncommon. You know, some people say, well, that seems weird. Why, why would I want to have a Texas address? Well, there's no state income taxes in Texas. There's access to specific sources of funding that's not available elsewhere. And the address, you know, Texas is one of the, the best places according to national statistics to start or grow a business. But ignoring all that, you know, you can operate in other states, but be domiciled in a different one. There's lots of businesses that formed out of Delaware, out of Nevada, out of Wyoming in the past. That doesn't mean that that's where they live or, or where they work out of. So yeah, don't let that be a barrier. But yes, you're exactly right, Doug. We could start the first one together using our commercial address and then open additional incubators together in other markets. That is, is fine. Again, since it's a virtual incubator, it's less dependent upon being in the community. So like Charlotte's in, um, ironically, Charlotte, is in Los Angeles. And so she might want to have one in Los Angeles. Well, if that's really what she wants, that's fine. But you know what's going to happen to her overhead? Rents in Los Angeles aren't cheap, right? So all of a sudden, we're going to be loading on a lot more expense. The client doesn't get more benefit out of it. And in fact, if she forms one in California, they're going to be paying a lot more taxes than if, the, if she based her incubator here off of, off of our commercial address. But if it makes you feel better or you see other uh, reasons for it, absolutely, Doug, we can form incubators together. We can do one in Honolulu together, one in Anchorage, and one in every other continental uh, 48 United States, if you prefer. Okay, move on to the next question. So with the incubator, this is the model we're talking about the incubator. We're not talking about any of our other small business resources. So please don't infer what we're talking about here has to do with the access to capital program or, or so forth. Here, we're specifically talking about the incubator model. And so that, that's the answer, Doug, to make sure. All right, does anyone else have any questions? My goal today was to make sure that we, we piece together some of the missing information that we didn't properly cover yesterday, not out of purpose, just uh, based on feedback you all gave us. So if you're interested in collaborating and setting up a, a joint venture incubator or, or more than one, let's do it. it it's a great opportunity. Uh, you're, you're not gonna find, I don't think, a more lucrative way to help people. And this is not some big expense to you either. Again, the, the cost for us to set up a joint venture license agreement is the equivalent of, of $1,000 a month, but we break that down and we finance that at 0%, or we can go for third-party financing if you prefer. So with that being said, if you're interested in collaborating, uh, submit your information here. 
If you know of other entrepreneurs and or insurance agents, share this message with them and we'll pay you $5,000 for everyone that you refer to us that we set up an incubator with. They'll love you and, and you'll make an easy five grand for just getting us the, the prospect. We're wanting to open incubators across the country in joint venture relationships with professionals um, that uh, are, are hungry, that are motivated and uh, have a, a similar philosophy. All right, thanks everyone. We will talk to you soon. Let us know if we can collaborate. Bye-bye.